a few of you might have heard me speak before, but um, anyway, this presentation's on the Scottish outliers, and there's um, just a quick picture of um, one of the islands with some puffins on. So a quick kind of thing about me. So I've been a diver for the past 10 years. I've worked um, in a inland dive centre, Vobster, for those of you that don't know. And um, during my time there, I kind of decided that, well, I just I really enjoy diving, to be honest. Um, so I, I started getting um, qualifications across various different agencies. Um, and then after that, I went on to, to Plymouth University and started doing um, an undergrad, undergraduate degree there. I then went on to do a master's at Harriet Watt. And um, that was when I really decided that I did want to kind of go forward with the, um, like with marine biology. I know that a lot of people kind of go into it, but it's actually, it's really hard to pursue exactly what you did at university. Um, so I ended up working on a charter vessel and um, I have many experiences there and um, most of which I will be talking about today. Um, but I also am now studying um, for a PhD with Newcastle University. So first of all, kind of like what is an outlier? So there's many, um, many of them and the Scottish ones I've just shown on this um, this map here. So starting on on the right hand side you've got um Sewell scary lighthouse Sewell stack and then as we go a bit more west you've got north rona solar skier and in the bottom left you've got hertha or um as others may know as st kilda so these are the islands that i'm going to um talk about this evening and kind of give you kind of a bit of a, a brief overview about what you can find out there so i started with Sewell scary now, Sul Skerry is quite a small island. I've just put um, a size in that bottom left hand corner. So you can see that it's actually kind of not very wide across at all. Um, and it gives you that kind of like idea of the scale of the place. Um, and in terms of kind of how high it is and how much it comes out of the water, um, I put that other photograph in. So it gives you this idea of actually it's quite a skinny island and there is no protection from the elements out there but there is a lighthouse on it and it used to be the most remote like a uh, remotely kind of manned lighthouse but these days it's all done remotely um but the reason i'm talking about soul scary is because there is um there's a group on there called the soul scary seabird group and um, this was established in 1975 and um Basically, a couple of guys that were um, that were interested in birds wanted to come and monitor the population out on the island. So they kind of took it upon themselves to catch whatever boat they could out there, mostly fishing boats that would occasionally venture out there, and um, set up this this group. And um, because of this group, um, they've got records of all the birds that have been there since 1975. Um, it's also now a specially protected area because of the sea life and the wildlife over there. Um, and to give you an idea of the kind of stuff that goes on there is that getting onto the island with all this gear is really tricky. So typically the birders would arrive in the afternoon, kind of load the boat up, and then we would start steaming across in the evening with the idea of arriving on the island in the early hours in the morning. Now, the good thing about the Scottish weather in the summer is that you have a lot of daylight. So we'd arrive at kind of 5 a.m. ish, and then we'd start the kind of gruelling task of taking everything off the main charter vessel onto the rib, scooting it across to the island, and then lifting it up onto the island. And you can see here on the right hand side that you end up using a lot of ropes just to kind of start pulling gear up. And on the left hand side image, you've got kind of the waters dropping down. So if you can time it for high tide, that's great, but that's not always what happens. Um, and unfortunately there, there used to be this railway line um, that you can see on the right hand side that the lighthouse men used to use 
they chuck their supplies on it to bring it up the um bring it up to the top but over the last kind of many years it's just deteriorated and we've ended up again you just haul everything by hand so you can see a lot of work goes into this and it takes about um about five hours to unload all this and they have to take everything up there for their kind of they normally stay for about three weeks so that's water that's food that's just absolutely everything and then um you've got the camp set up so there's a certain area that they camp in because it's safe from um all the nests of the different types of bird the um the puffin in particular has all these little burrows and the last thing you want to do is kind of shove your foot down one of them because that's not going to be a very pretty sight for the bird. Um, we also took across this um, shed in that middle, middle photo, and I can't tell you how awkward it was to carry these massive pieces of wood across in a small rib. <laughs> but um, you can see here, it's just kind of like a camping setup, really. You've got a couple of tents, um, the shed they use to kind of eat meal times in. And whilst many of these photos have really nice blue skies, it's not always like that. But we're really here because the birds and you can see from this photo across here all the gannets that are just completely taking over the island almost and you can see the three guys that are sat there and they've got this long pole and what they're doing there is essentially hooking a gannet um, and then they'll ring that gannet and then ring the chicks as well um, and I think for me this photo kind of really kind of describes that island and it's it's something that's pretty incredible that the sounds the smells it's just kind of gobsmacking really when you turn up and you just it's just enamored by life really and um, so you've got gannets on the island you've also got plenty of puffins um most of you might have um, bumped into a puffin if you've been up to um orkney or shetland they're pretty kind of friendly creatures so you can actually get up quite close and personal with them um, shags as well they're found on the island um and one of the other photos isn't coming up i don't know why but um that's an arctic tern um chick so they get arctic terns on there um a bonksy but also known um to the southerners as um the great skewer really the, these guys are here for the science and um over the last kind of well since 75 so 20 well nearly 20 30 nearly 40 years and um, they've been collecting all this data and what they found is that overall gannets are on the increase and it wasn't actually until 2003 that gannets even resided on the island and they had 13 pairs in um 2003 but in the last trip which was in 2018 they have 4,600 breeding pairs. So you can see that's a completely different kind of dynamic shift on the species that live on that island. Um, puffins as well. Puffins kind of have started to slightly decrease. But what was more fascinating was that the, the baby chicks and the baby puffins, also known as pufflings, their weight was significantly just decreasing. And um, they think this is because of their prey, because of the lesser sand deal. And for reasons unknown, maybe climate, maybe kind of fishing, I'm I'm not sure. But um the lesser sand deal wasn't readily available. So these puffins will then fledge at quite a low weight, really. Um shags as well, those um the pairs are decreasing as well. And the Arctic tern for me was an interesting one because they used to have quite a few breeding pairs in, in the past. But unfortunately, at the moment, there is only one pair on the island. Um, again, I, I couldn't tell you exactly why they seem to have decreased, but maybe the gannets coming in has just um, kind of put them off as such, but I'm not sure. Um, and then again, the Bonksy they've been residing there since the 1900s from um, previous studies but um they've increased as well not as dramatically as um the gannets but they have increased quite a lot um, and to give you an idea of um the sand eel size you can see here in in 1996 those sand eels were pretty substantial and 
something that you'd find and see pictures of in puffins beaks but now like in 2007 they just dropped off significantly and it's just not enough to feed those baby puffins um and in 2003 they also found that the the adult puffins were trying to feed their chicks um pipe fish and any of you that have um, seen a pipe fish before they're long and skinny and they're bony and the chicks just couldn't couldn't eat them because they just weren't the right type of food um but anyway moving on from um soul scary um the next one that i'm going to talk about is soul stack so stool stack is kind of um kind of southwest from soul scary a little bit further down um and to give you an idea of size here that entire island is about 200 to 250 meters long and only 50 meters thick so it gives you the idea of how small that island is and you can see there they've got a crack that just goes straight through the middle of it and as, again as you can see on that photo there's lots of white dots and those are gannets so um it's believed that well this island has always had gannets on it from previous records so the idea is that they have moved on and started populating soul scary and it's just kind of a they've moved over to there because all of the space is taken on this island um, and there was 5,000 breeding pairs um, on the last count and that has been stable for at least 100 years um, the birders again would come and ring birds on here and take population numbers um, however as you can see from that previous photo it's not the easiest island to land on so um, you can see that they don't always get there whether it's weather or kind of conditions um, but there is another reason to come and visit this island is because you can go diving on it so there is a wreck at the bottom of the island called the MV Menina. Um, essentially, she was a Greek cargo ship and it was terrible weather. And unfortunately, she ran aground onto Sul Stack and a few people died. And um, I do think this is kind of really bad luck in a lot of ways because, I mean, it is a 250 meter long island almost in the middle of nowhere. So it is very unfortunate. Um, and parts of that wreck can actually be found in Orkney um, and the home in Scapa But really that wreck is entirely broken up. You can see it's in the middle of nowhere. It's susceptible to the elements out there. And um, it ranges from kind of like 25 metres all the way down to 50 metres. But the point of this wreck is the life out there is just absolutely incredible. Um, I've got a couple of videos that hopefully you'll be able to see. Um, and you can i'll talk through it but um you can see like all the plumes and enemies and all the fish and um at the back you can see this part of the wreckage coming into play there um and you can just well parts of those are not boulders they're just parts of the wreckage but it's just absolutely teeming with life and um you have to bear in mind that this footage was taking taken at about 40 meters so that kind of gives you the idea of what conditions are like that when you get the right weather and the kind of just the clarity of the seawater it is like diving in Malta or in a foreign country um, and to give you an idea of kind of the, the problems that were faced almost with diving for me was the visibility um, because there were so many fish it's just absolutely incredible that this kind of small island can just be home to so much incredible incredible life and you can see the starfish on the bottom underneath the diver and um that's was for any of you that knows um the old bezac chairman <laughs> um just kind of like fascinated with by how many fish there are surrounding you and it is it's almost the most bizarre thing that i've ever seen but also the most incredible experience and um as you can see as the, the camera kind of starts tilting up here you'll see just how many fish there are in the water and again bearing in mind the depth you're at there the light penetration is just amazing Ooh. 
Um, so on to the next outlier. So the next one I'll talk about is North Rona. So again, this is another island that the birders occasionally come and visit, but you can you can see from the photos here, you, it's just a very different island. So it's a lot bigger. Um, the lighthouse stands kind of at 108 meters, so it's a lot taller, but also you've got grass and you've got kind of a lot of land there. Um, North Rona used to be inhabited and they used to be completely self-sufficient. So they actually kind of ended up in a position where they had sheep and they grew crops and they actually had more crops than they needed. But um, they kind of moved on. And um, there's also remnants of a village from the 7th and 8th century of Norse settlers. And it's not quite clear exactly why those guys left then, but you can see parts of the village that used to be there and parts of a church. And there used to be a cross that resided there for somebody called St. Ronan. And um, as far as I'm aware, they haven't actually ever pinpointed who this particular person was. There's been a couple of hints that oh, it might be this person or it might be this person, but um, they've never been actually entirely sure who it was. Um, unfortunately, throughout these periods of settlement, there were quite a lot of tragic consequences. Um, it is an island and it is in the middle of nowhere and people rarely venture out that way. And I think it was in the 1400s, um, there was like 30 or so people living there. Um, and unfortunately, a ship came, came in and people came along onto shore and they brought rats with them and the rats ate through absolutely everything that the people on the island had in the community and unfortunately the community perished along with the rats after because they again had no food. Um, more recently there was um, a couple of shepherds that um, decided to stay in the island in I think it was in the 1800s and they were visited by a passing ship and they said to them, oh, do you want to come back to the mainland? We're happy to take you across. And they were kind of quite happy and like living on the island. So they passed on the offer. Unfortunately, when someone came back to the island in April, um, both men had perished throughout the winter. So you can see it's not kind of an island that doesn't have harsh realities to it, even though these photos kind of show you what a lovely place it is. Um, but um, since then, there aren't any people that permanently live on there, but the shepherds do come across every so often to, to kind of look after the sheep that still roam on there. Um, the other life that you get there as well, you get you get a lot of birds naturally, not the, the kind of vast amount that you get on um, the other islands that I've already spoken about, but you do get a lot of seals that are there and um, even different types of um, cetaceans and minke whales. So we. When I last visited, we were absolutely lucky enough to have this incredible encounter with um, a set of minke whales. So we were on the island and just looking at them in the bay. They were chilled out and we thought, oh, we'll look at them now because you know what it's like by the time you get down to the, the bottom and onto the boat to have a look, they'll all be gone. But um, they were just playing around and we actually managed to get down to the bottom and then we took the rib out and like knocked the engine out and these minky whales were just coming up next to us and just swimming past us completely kind of chilled out and it was absolutely amazing and um, you also get eagles there and um storm patrols and leeches patrol all of which you can kind of see and hear flying around when you're there um and then the next one which is pretty close to north rona it's solar skier it's 11 kilometers away so if you're going to one you may as well visit the other um, you can see here the topography is more similar to that of Sul Scary and Sul Stack compared to that of North Rona um, the island again is home to gannets and such birds and um, here we go and every year um, the men of Lewis have this um, traditional hunt where they go across, 10 men go across and they will capture um, gannet chicks and they take them back across with them. 
Um, now, I know there is a couple of um, kind of animal welfare groups that don't necessarily necessarily agree with this, but um, the government has actually granted them a special license. So they are the only people that are allowed to do this. And on top of that, it is sustainable, which is for me the most important part. Um, and because of this, it's actually become a nature reserve because of the sea life that you get out there. Um, and it's not just the birds, the diving there is absolutely incredible as well. Um, if I go back, yeah, if you look into this, into the kind of photo here, I hope you can see my arrow, you can see this kind of crack in that middle top right photo. Um, and in there is an amazing dive. It's this alley and as you go kind of through this underwater alley, you've got kelp on both sides and blue mows and enemies and jewel and enemies. And you've got all of these um, dogfish that just kind of sit in those alleys, kind of like half asleep. And it's just amazing to see this life that is really happy as well to interact with you. And I, I wonder whether this is partly because they don't really see human interaction. I mean, apart from the odd fishing boat that goes out there, really is kind of like just left to nature. And um, last time we were diving, um, we, we had the opportunity to kind of take photographs of um, razorbills and guillemots. And that was purely because they had decided that there was something in the water and it, it was, it was us. And um, they were just diving into the bubbles from the open circuit guys. And it was just amazing to see these birds that are just so clear in the water because the water's clear and they're jumping in to kind of see what's going on. Um, and the seals there are really friendly as well. They're kind of, they're friendly, but they're also a bit scared to approach you. And I think my personal opinion on that is probably because they've not, they've not seen you before or are a bit aware of you kind of wondering what this human is or even this thing underwater is. Um, and you can see this photo here with the camera was left that they just, they're just inquisitive beings. And it was, it's pretty amazing to have the opportunity to, Kind of almost converse with a seal underwater and i quite like this photo this um video because i kind of just chilled out probably wondering what's going on with everybody in the water um, and this is um another dive on on the sewer gear um and it's essentially kind of a big rock so you've got this big rock that doesn't protrude out of the water but you can see um, that the kind of water makes like little weight little waves so you can see that there's something there so um if you dive kind of to the side of it there's this underwater kind of sea cave slash arch and you can see here with the diver in the foreground that he's just kind of chilling looking at something in the cave and like you've got all these jewel and enemies that kind of phosphorus in the water and then as you kind of go up, you can see in the top image there, it's really clear. That's where the sun's kind of coming through. And um, I think the top of that cave is only in about eight meters. So it's not deep. But you can see like everyone's kind of come through this cave. And when you get to the top there, you can shoot round to the right. And there's just endless kind of kelp beds at kind of 12, 15, 20 meters purely because that sunlight is just coming through that water so well. And on to my last outlier. So um, Persia or St Kilda, as you may know as, is actually the only outlier that I've not made it to yet. So I'm a bit gutted on that front, but um, hopefully I'll make it in the future. But um, speaking to many people and um, reading many books of this fascinating kind of community of people, um, it's on the top of my bucket list and probably many others as well. Um, so the history really is that this place is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it's had a continuous habitation for at least 2000 years. Um, the first written account of this small community was in 1549 and the guy simply wrote that they were a simple poor people um, that knew nothing about religion. And then it wasn't until 1697 when Martin Martin kind of visited the island and came back to write about it. 
and he said that essentially they were the happiest people that he'd ever met. Um, there was 180 of them at the time, and annually they would eat 22,600 gannets. And I think what made their life so kind of special but happy was that on that island, everybody owns everything. So you don't own individual things. Um, everyone's part of the community. Everything is everybody's. And they'd work together to kind of have a life. So every morning they would have something that they would call um, a parliament. And during that morning, all the jobs would be laid out and they decide what needed to be done for the day. So that would be, for example, going onto the cliffs, climbing onto the cliffs and grabbing like eggs from the gannets or gannets themselves um, or tending to the crops, whatever kind of needed to be done that day. But this didn't mean that it wasn't like a hard or dangerous life there because obviously there's no electricity, there's no modern medicine. So it's a very different life to, to how we know, really. Um, and they only had one street and they'd all kind of like live together. And then in winter, they'd bring the animals inside and they'd live inside the house with the animals. But um, I think for me, the beginning of the end really was when we'd move forward technology and we had the industrial revolution and then kind of people started visiting this island and unfortunately they brought smallpox and cholera to the island um, and they really were a healthy group of people until outside influences started bringing illnesses. Uh, the worst is tetanus, um, killing 80% of babies it wasn't uncommon for mothers to have 10 or 12 babies and only have one or two survive. Um, and one of the biggest things that the modern world brought with them was religion. So um, a few hundred years ago, a priest came to visit and um, essentially over time, they'd ended up having religious services every day in the morning and um, a couple of sermons in the weekend, like on a Sunday. and because of this, they ended up spending more time in the church or having services than actually concentrating on the jobs that needed to be done to run that small community. Um, and on top of that, uh, tourists started coming across, but they didn't really know what tourists were. So they actually kind of got taken advantage of and ended up losing some of their prized possessions in exchange for things such as money. But a community such as theirs didn't run on money. So what could they do with these little pieces of silver? Um, so I think that a variety of things like that, and I know that there was an emigration to Australia, um, it, it essentially led to a decrease in people and their eventual evacuation in 1930. Um, so I've just put some pictures in here so you can see you've got Village Bay like on the top and kind of one of the old houses along with um, I think it's the MOD that kind of have a base there now. Um, and you can see all the houses on the street on the right hand side. And then just an image of um, some of the women and the girls that used to live there. So apart from all being absolutely amazing places, you can kind of see the where they are now back again on the map. It's the journeys that kind of made them what they were as well. So every single journey, I've done going to one of those places we always get dolphins um, probably because of the bow on the boat they like to ride in it um, but it's just amazing the wildlife that is just out there and it's just I know part of it is being in the right place at the right time but there is a lot to offer out there um, and like the minke whales and the gannets and the birds that come and sit on the boat for a while it's just like absolutely amazing in my mind <laughs> Um, so really, all I've got to say now is my thanks, um, especially to Soul Scary Ringing Group. They've um, let me have um, some of their work, which is amazing, um, as well as Jez Blackburn, who kind of runs that group now. Um, Bob Anderson for a hand of full of photos. And the same goes to May Dorica, Alex Wazinski and Jen Smith. And um, really, like, this is one of my favourite photos that I took. And it just makes me laugh that there's this puffing kind of in this channel and he's got his two mates that are chatting to him and I sat there for about half an hour watching this puffin just walk back and forth and back and forth and you're just wondering like 
what on earth is going on in his head when he's got wings to get out of there but um yeah that was him and yeah that, that's it really i'll just stop sharing and hopefully if you've got any questions feel free